Hi, I'm Big Me Berserker. It's time to put the one D&D bashing on hold for a while and begin to grow our tabletop role-playing community by convincing players that new isn't always better. You may have heard the term old school gaming and wondered what exactly it means. The general consensus of old school is pre-third edition. Third edition was a complete change of system that was all but incompatible with previous editions. Sure, you could use your old books for inspiration, but character generation was completely different and so many things changed. You only have to compare a second edition stat block with a third edition one, for an example. And some of those third edition stat blocks took up a whole page. Now, I know there will be those of you out there thinking that proper old school gaming was before second edition, because it was grittier and more Gygaxian. But in my opinion, this is more a subject of flavour than system. First and second editions could be used interchangeably, with very little work. You just can't say the same about second and third, or second and fifth. So with that out of the way, I want to recommend an old school version of Dungeons & Dragons that has been commonly referred to as the complete D&D game. One that goes beyond the concepts of mere adventuring and treasure hunting to include rules for attracting followers, building strongholds and forming a dominion, rules for mass combat to expand or protect your dominion, and rules enabling players to strike for immortality if that's what they want to do. This version of the game is commonly referred to as Beckme, or simply Basic Dungeons and Dragons, which is a bit of a misnomer given it is far from basic in scope. Beckme is mostly credited to Frank Mensa and was first released in 1983, growing as a series of box sets over a number of years. There was the basic set, another reason why the basic D&D name stuck, and this set out the core rules and covered player progression up to level 3. There was the expert set for levels 4 to 14, detailing wilderness adventuring, that is life outside of the dungeon, and rules for attracting followers and building a stronghold. There was the companion set for levels 15 to 25, detailing high level play such as forming dominions, mass combat and interaction with the planes of existence. The master set was for adventuring the final mortal levels of 26 to 36, detailing weapon mastery and siege warfare as well as rules on attaining immortality. And finally there was the immortal set for when you actually became immortal. This basic expert, companion, master and immortal collection is commonly abbreviated into Beckme, hence the name. Of course, as the game developed, it was frequently revised, with the later box sets clarifying or amending rules from earlier ones. This led to some confusion and the rules being a bit all over the place. So in 1991, the entire set of rules, except for the rules for playing as an immortal, were brought together into one volume by Aaron Alston and called the Rules Cyclopedia. This cleared up many of the rules and made them easier to understand. This volume is around 300 pages. 300 pages for a complete version of D&D. That's really good going, considering that the 5e Player's Handbook has slightly more than this on its own. And this leads on to the main difference of Beckme compared to 5e and that's the simplicity of the system. You didn't need another 300 pages telling you how to DM. The simplicity gave you the confidence to jump straight in. So now I've given you a bit of background to Beckme. Let's discuss some of the differences from 5e. This may be done by working our way through the Beckme character sheet. Let's start with character class. Beckme is rather simplistic in terms of character classes available leading to its biggest criticism, that it uses race as class. What this means is that there are four human classes, the cleric, fighter, magic user, and thief. And there are three demi-humans, dwarf, elf, and halfling. The rules state these are referred to as demi-humans because they are similar to humans. Each one has racial abilities. For instance, an elf can cast magic. What this all means is that, if sticking to just the rules cyclopedia, you cannot combine a demi-human with a human class. For instance, you can't become a dwarf cleric. However, 
there is a very successful comprehensive Beckme campaign setting called Mistara, which was serialized in a number of gazetteers and contains information for expanding the options of demi-humans. Indeed, the edition called Rockholm, the Land of the Dwarfs, offers the option to have a dwarf cleric, and there are similar options available in the publications specific to elves and halflings. There is a further element to character classes that is sometimes seen as contentious, and that's demi-humans being limited in the number of levels they are able to achieve. Humans may, but rarely do, go up to 36th level. Demi-humans are restricted due to having abilities that humans do not have access to, so are limited in respect of game balance. I mean, why would anyone choose to be a human otherwise? These limitations are that dwarves may only go up to 12th level, elves 10th level, and halflings 8th level. These may seem quite low, but all classes do not gain many hit points beyond 9th level, and there is still some progression that can be made by demi-humans in the form of attack ranks. Overall, Beckme character class options are not as restrictive as you may have heard, and there are even more options available from the Creature Crucible publications released between 1989 and 1992. So there's plenty of choice if you want it. So let's take a look at ability scores. These have remained standard since the very early days of D&D, so at first glance you won't find much difference here. However, you will notice that they are ordered Strength, Intelligence, Wisdom, Dexterity, Constitution and Charisma. I'm not sure why the listing of these abilities differs from modern day, maybe you can let me know in the comments, but it's purely cosmetic. What is different though is the value of modifier gained for each score. Apologies for the press clipping look, my PDF was low quality. Where 5e modifiers range from minus 4 to plus 4 for scores between 3 and 18, in Beckme the range is minus 3 to plus 3, with a large span of average being 9 to 12, offering no modifier at all. These may seem boring at first glance to those used to obtaining bonuses quite often, but it serves to demonstrate how exceptional scores above 12 and below 9 are in the D&D world. What's more, the method of generating these scores is strictly 3d6 in ability order. You can of course house rule it any way you like, but if you're after the Beckme feel, I don't recommend it. A further quirk of Beckme and many old school games is that your choice of character to play is limited to the scores you generate. You can't be a dwarf if your constitution is below 9. You can't be an elf if your intelligence is below 9. This makes the availability of these races rare, especially if you've rolled your abilities in strict rotation, giving the Beckme campaign world that feeling of wonder if you ever do come across an adventuring demi-human. A further importance conveyed by ability scores is something called the prime requisite. One or two abilities may be designated as the prime requisite for certain classes. For example, a fighter's prime requisite is strength. This means that if their strength score is between 13 and 15, they gain a 5% bonus to experience points. If between 16 and 18, this rises to 10%. So obviously, you would want the highest score in your prime requisite. Finally, a major difference from 5e regarding ability scores is that they never really change much, except through injury, causing them to go down, or a wish spell or other divine intervention to make them go up should the DM think it's appropriate. Ability scores do not go up with levels and never go above 18, unless your DM says different. This may seem boring to players arriving from 5e, but it's actually one less thing to tie up your mind when your character progresses. You become less concerned about build and more involved in how your character grows within the story. After all, there are no backgrounds in Beckme in terms of it being a mechanic. Your character's background is something you work on with the DM. So moving on to hit dice and hit points. You have far fewer hit points in Beckme than you might have in 5e. You can see in this list the hit dice for each class showing their maximum available. And if you really play old school, 
you won't even get maximum hit points at first level unless you roll them. You still get to add your constitution bonus to your hit dice, but after 9th level, each class, apart from the halfling who maxes out at 8th, only receives a set number of hit points and no further constitution bonuses. Therefore, a 9th level fighter with a constitution of 18 may have a maximum of 99 hit points. Compare that to a 5e fighter of the same level and constitution, it would be 126. Maybe not too much of a difference, but how about 20th level? A Begmi fighter would have 121 hit points, two hit points for every level beyond 9th. Compared to a 5e fighter with 280, the world of Begmi is a dangerous place and hit points are in short supply, especially if you're a magic user or thief. So let's talk about saving throws now. This was a major change when 3rd edition came along, and if I'm honest, made quite a bit of sense back then. However, there's something to be said for the antiquated articulation of saving throws in Beckme and Old School in general. They sometimes seem completely appropriate to the situation, whilst at other times you must work with your group to agree what to roll a saving throw against when it isn't obvious. So in Beckme, as with many Old School D&D games, the saving throws are Poison or Death Ray. As the name suggests, this is required when exposed to poison or something that can instantly kill your character. Magic Wands. To avoid or limit spell effects from a wand. Turn to Stone or Paralysis. To avoid petrification from an attack or spell, or paralysis from, for example, a sting. Dragon Breath. This one is obvious, but to dodge the effects of a Dragon Breath attack. Rod spell or staff to avoid the effects of magical attacks from these sources. Clearly, these differ greatly from 5e saving throws, those being some version of your ability score bonus. Ability score bonuses in Beckme can still affect your saving throw score, but essentially the score is linked to your level more than it is your ability score. So as you increase in experience, you grow in resistance to magical attacks. This again does away with the need to increase ability scores. What you don't have in Beckme that is such a major part of 5e is the concept of difficulty class. All saving throw attempts are dependent on your resistance, not the attacker's experience. So even an apprentice may still have a strong chance to charm someone. In the event of such an attempt, a character would look at their character sheet for the saving throw figure related to spells and attempt to roll the number or above it, suffering the effects of the spell on a failure. Beckme and old school in general is quite deadly, so you may want to adjust your play if coming from 5e, so as not to get into such situations in the first place. Since we've touched on saving throws, we may as well discuss magic, specifically spells and spell casting. There are three types of spells in Beckme, magical, clerical and druidic. A number of classes can cast spells, as shown in this list. The Woken and the Shaman on this list are actually monster spellcasters. The only player classes that may cast spells from first level are magic users and elves, with clerics able to cast spells from second level once their beliefs have been strengthened. Druid is a pathway that is available to clerics after ninth level. The main difference between the 5e and Beckme magic systems is that Beckme uses what's referred to as a Vancean system, inspired by author Jack Vance's Dying Earth series. All this means is that a limited number of what spells a character knows may be memorised, based on their level, like on the magic user table shown. Once a spell is cast, it is removed from the memory and cannot be relearned until the next day, or after a night's sleep. This provokes some critical decision making by the spellcaster at the start of each day as they choose to memorise the spells they think they'll need that day. Spells are more deadly than you might be used to. For instance, the duration of whole person is 90 minutes and many spells have save or die results. If you face a magic user, you'd best get the jump on him or pray your saving throws are effective. Essentially, magic in Beckby is dangerous but conversely, magic users are far weaker than in 5e when cornered, having no repeatable cantrips 
like Ray of Frost, etc. There's a different level of fear when facing a spellcaster in Beckme that is not quite there in 5e with its save every round mechanic. Going head to head with one, even a low level one, is a gamble. Right, on to experience points and levelling. I've already mentioned the number of levels Beckme covers, but the XP required to gain a level differs from class to class, an attempt to achieve some level of balance. Also, XP can be gained from defeating monsters, but is more readily available from finding treasure, as you may gain 1 XP for every gold piece you find. This means the focus of increasing your power is by increasing your wealth, which makes sense in a way. As mentioned earlier, your XP achievement may be improved if you have a high prime requisite. You can expect to stay within a certain level in Beckme for much longer than might be the case in 5e, but that's all part of the process. Beckme is much more about developing your character's place in the world rather than driving up the levels. In fact, reaching your next level is such an achievement that it is very much celebrated, even if it does draw dark envy from the other players in your group. The final thing I'll talk about in this video is alignment. Alignment is quite limited in Beckme, being only made up of three. That's lawful, neutral and chaotic. And these are described as more of a code of behaviour for your character. You can see them listed here. Many players used to import the other six alignments from Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the ones you might recognise from 5e. But this was never actually necessary. Each of the three alignments in Beckme is more associated with behaviour than a cosmic cause, and therefore easier to apply, in my opinion. So I'm going to stop there. This video is getting a little long, and I've barely scratched the surface of this great game. I'll do deeper dives into more of the game as I do more videos, including into the Beckme catalogue, which is available from Drive-Thru RPG if you wanted to check them out. My objective here is to show you an alternative, old-school D&D game if you're thinking that one D&D is just a step too far. But if you're thinking, this is lame, I want more, that's okay. If you do, stick with 5e, but I will ask you to give back me or any other old-school game a go sometime. Just try it. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Anyway, please like and subscribe if I've earned it, and thank you for watching. I'm Beckme Berserker, and I hope to see you back here soon.